Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinado. I will be today's moderator. With that, it is my very great pleasure to uh, introduce our last speaker for the season, uh, Dr. Sean Williamson. Dr. Williamson is a postdoctoral fellow at FAU, currently working with Dr. Wanneken in the Marine Science Laboratory at Boca Raton and the Gumbo Limbo Environmental uh, Complex. And if you don't know if you've ever been to Gumbo Limbo here in, in Boca Raton, um, yeah, we do actually have a uh, marine science laboratory uh, there. Um, his research focuses on three broad areas of ecophysiology, spatial ecology, and conservation science and planning. Um, Dr. William, Williamson has a very interesting uh, resume in that he uh, earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Wollongong in Australia, and then also was at the University College uh, Cork in Ireland. Um, he then went back to Australia, where he earned a doctoral degree on crocodile, squamate, and turtle embryonic development at Monash University in Australia. And then uh, he worked as a research scientist at Upwell Turtles, which is a non-governmental organization, uh, and then did a postdoctoral fellowship um, again at Monash University in Australia. Now here at Florida Atlantic, uh, he is working on spatial ecology and physiology of sea turtles and also manages the science, education and art scholars program for the FAU Marine Science Laboratory. With that, welcome, Sean. We look forward to your uh, presentation. Great, thanks for the introduction, Karen. I'll just... Um bring up my slides and share my screen. You can all see my presentation here. So yeah, my name's Sean and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Florida Atlantic University working in the Marine Science Laboratory. Uh, you can follow our goings on at the Marine Lab on our Instagram channel or our Facebook channel, which we've recently launched this year, um, which is exciting. It helps us with our outreach endeavors and our science communication of the awesome research that we conduct at the FAU Marine Lab, which is directed by Professor Jeanette Wynikin. So I'm going to be talking today about a bunch of research that was either conducted during my um, PhD at Monash University or um, during my employment at Upwell Turtles, which, as Karen mentioned, is a conservation NGO headquartered in California, and also more recent work that I've been doing here at Florida Atlantic University. So if you didn't already tell by my accent in the introduction from, from Karen, I'm from Australia. I grew up in a small seaside town here in the, the top left. You can see it's called Kayama. It's about two hours south of Sydney. And it's fair to say during high school, I was pretty distracted and obsessed with the ocean. Um, it's, it was, you know, wasn't helped by the fact that it was a world-class surf break uh, right near where I grew up. But I did have a really important influence during high school, and that's this guy on the right. Um, shout out to Mr. Berry at Kaima High. He really instilled in me a passion um, for environmental issues and sustainability. And I decided to pursue a career in science to help work on these issues. So after my bachelor's, I, I as Karen mentioned, I did my PhD at Monash University in Melbourne in the south of Australia and I actually went to Monash and pitched a project idea on working on penguin um, physiology and conservation. Uh, and Professor Richard Rayner, who, was, who took me on as a PhD student, said he thought my penguin ideas were great, but he'd actually ran out of, of penguin funding, funding at that time and suggested to me that maybe I'd, I'd entertain the idea of working on the conservation and research of, of turtles in Costa Rica. And I knew that turtles were a threatened group of species. And, and in the back of my mind, I also knew that Costa Rica was a pretty world-class surfing destination. And so it was a pretty easy sell. And so that's how I came to start working on sea turtles. Now, as I mentioned, sea turtles are a threatened group. So there's six, uh, six of the seven species of sea turtle are currently listed as threatened with the extinction by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And there are a range of, of threatening processes that are impacting sea turtles around the world. 
Um, I'm going to summarize a couple of them here. So one of the major key threats is fisheries bycatch. As you can see here, this total on the left has been accidentally caught in a fishing net. And this is leading to high and unsustainable levels of mortality in total populations around the world and is a major driver of population declines in sea turtle populations. Another main threat is also pollution and pathogens. So here on the left, you can see a photo that I took in Costa Rica with an olive ridley sea turtle with a fork, unfortunately stuck in its nose. It had probably ingested this fork thinking it was a crab appendage or a crab leg, and then tried to regurgitate it and that the fork had become subsequently stuck in its nose. So this is a very like clear and, and um, kind of shocking um, you know, piece of evidence about the impact that our human pollution activities are having on on sea turtle populations around the world. Another key threatening process for sea turtles is, is deliberate human harvest. Now, I should state that in some areas of the world, for example, in the north of Australia, um, traditional harvest of, of sea, turtle has, sea turtles has been happening for millennia. And uh, in some populations, this is sustainable, but in other populations, the, the direct and deliberate harvest of of sea turtle for consumption of either meat or eggs, or also use in the trade trade of, of bioko, which is sea turtle um, shell for ornamental value, is having um, negative impacts on, on certain populations around the world. Coastal development is also a major threatening process for sea turtle populations. Now, obviously, sea turtles spend most of their life at sea, but they must return to land to lay their eggs. And here you can see a nesting beach where a a seawall has been built really close to the, to the shoreline. You can see a turtle track along the seawall here where the turtles obviously come out of the water to lay its eggs, encountered the wall, and subsequently had to return to sea without laying its eggs. Global warming is, is the last threatening process that I'm going to mention here. And as, as you can see in this graph, we've already been experiencing a one degree or, or so increase in temperatures over the last 50 years, and it's predicted to get much worse over the coming century. And this is already having impacts on sea turtle populations around the world, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a minute, but it's gonna get a lot worse depending upon what trajectories we take with our um, carbon emissions. Now, egg relocation is a conservation tool that sea turtle conservationists and, and population managers can use to help address four of these threatening processes. So it doesn't really help with the fisheries bycatch issue, but egg translocations can be used to move eggs um, out of areas where there's, there's high pollutants, for example, in an oil spill scenario. Um, egg relocations can also be used to prevent deliberate human harvest, so in areas where there are egg poachers or um, illegal wildlife uh, traders who collect eggs off the beach, conservationists can relocate eggs to hatcheries in order to keep a better, better oversight of those eggs and better protect those nests from illegal poaching. Egg relocation can also be used for um, addressing impacts of coastal development. And finally, and probably um, more recently, egg relocation is being looked at as a potential um, strategy to help combat global warming, moving eggs from nesting sites that are potentially no longer suitable for embryonic development and moving them to areas that are better suited for embryonic development. This has already been done with freshwater turtle species, for example, in Western Australia with the Western Swamp Tortoise. So as I mentioned, these um, egg movements, I mean, we can broadly think of them as conservation translocations. So eggs, um, and probably the most famous example of this would be the, the Gulf of Mexico BP oil spill in 2010, where tens of thousands of, of sea turtle eggs were moved from the Gulf Coast of Florida to the Atlantic Coast. And it's possible that we may need to utilize these egg relocations or conservation translocations more into the future. Um, we're already seeing uh, at the moment, the loss of, of major sea turtle nesting beaches. For example, in the Hawaiian Islands, there's been disappearing islands with sea level rise and, and Rain Island, which is in the north of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which is the largest green sea turtle nesting beach in the world. Um, 
so the, the has the the largest numbers of green sea turtles. It's actually quite a small island, and that those two islands are experiencing sea level rise, which is causing major impacts on these nesting populations of of sea turtles. So there is potential into the future that we may need to utilize these egg relocation methods for conservation translocations. But before we go willy-nilly moving a bunch of eggs around, it's important to understand more about embryonic development of turtles, which is something I worked on quite extensively during my PhD. So you can, most people think of embryonic development as, as usually continuous from fertilization of an ova um, through until hatching or birth of a, a neonate. Obviously in the case of oviparous or egg laying species, such as sea turtles and, and some other reptiles, um, there's also a process of egg laying that occurs somewhere between fertilization and, and hatching. And most people think of this process as continuous. However, there, there's two really interesting components that we need to think of um, when it comes to turtle development, which are, which are really important. Firstly, all turtles studied today pause embryonic development prior to overposition or egg laying. This is termed pre-overpositional embryonic arrest. A bit of a mouthful. But basically, you can think of this as embryos entering a deep freeze, sort of like what you, you see in the movies. So there's the embryo sitting in a state of suspended animation with no active uh, cell differentiation or cell growth. And it's sort of waiting there in the oviduct, ready to be laid. Now, this is a really cool adaptation that turtles have, allows them to, to uh, link in with their ecology, ecology more effectively. So some freshwater turtle species, for example, can hold fertilized embryos or eggs in, in the oviduct for um, a full year while they wait for the right conditions for nesting. Sea turtles probably have a, a lesser ability to do this, maybe a few days to to our at most um, probably a month to hold fertilized eggs in the oviduct. And another important thing to understand about turtle embryonic development is that eggs are susceptible to movement induced mortality or embryos are susceptible to movement induced mortality. So if you rotate an egg or if you vigorously shake an egg after it's been laid and, and dropped into the nest, it will subsequently kill the embryo. And so this is termed movement-induced mortality. So any egg translocations need to be conscious of this potential impact and need to make sure that if they do move the eggs, they're not going to lead to a dead embryo inside the egg once they've moved it. From previous works by some of my colleagues at Monash University, we know a little bit more now about the embryonic arrest. So Tony Rafferty, uh, you can see on the left here probing a green sea turtle at Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And he found that the oviducts of gravid green sea turtles are very low in oxygen prior to egg laying. So they're what we call hypoxic and they have about 1% oxygen availability in the oviduct. And then the nest is normoxic or normal oxygen availability when the eggs are laid at overposition. Uh, so that's about 21% oxygen, which hopefully you're all breathing right now. And Tony also found that if you take eggs as soon as they've been laid into the nest and place them back into an artificial um, environment that's low in oxygen, you can extend the embryonic arrest artificially for the length of time that the eggs remain in that hypoxic or low oxygen condition. So usually um, the method for maintaining this embryonic arrest is to place eggs in perspex, chamber, perspex chambers um, or plexiglass um, filled with, with nitrogen to exclude any oxygen. This extends the arrest by mimicking the oxygen availability in the oviducts of the mother. However, before starting my PhD, we didn't really understand too much about when the arrest breaks after egg laying. We knew that obviously the eggs are laid into normoxia or 21% oxygen. Um, and we knew that if we got to them immediately and put them into hypoxia, we could extend the arrest, but we didn't know 
how how long after laying or how long after overposition until the embryo started to develop again. This could have important implications for understanding more about the ideal time to relocate eggs. So in order to investigate this, I collected a bunch of green sea turtle eggs from Heron Island in Australia. Now these were collected at the time of overposition and walked um, a short two to five minute walk to the research station at Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And I quickly placed them into one of 10 treatments. So we had an anormoxia or control treatment for the duration of incubation. So they were still placed into these perspex chambers, but they were kept in 21% oxygen. And then eggs in the other nine treatments were placed into hypoxia, low oxygen, 1% oxygen availability for three days at various points after overposition. So one treatment group eggs were placed in half an hour after laying, one hour after laying, two hours, four hours, eight hours, all the way through with some other treatments until 48 hours after laying. What I found from this study was that eggs that were placed into hypoxia or low oxygen within 12 hours after overposition all had comparable hatching success to the control treatments. So here in this graph, you can see hatching success on the y-axis and treatment on the x-axis. And you'll note where I've marked with this arrow that after 12 hours in the nest, if you then subsequently place eggs into hypoxia, none of the eggs hatch. So you can see in 16 hour, 24 hour and 48 hour treatments, there was no eggs that hatched if they were placed into hypoxia. So this means that the arrest is broken at some point between 12 and 16 hours after overposition or after they've been dropped into the nest. Our data also suggests that eggs cannot re-arrest development after that point if they're placed back into a low oxygen environment. And this actually links quite nicely with the timing of, of when eggs start to become susceptible from movement-induced mortality. So it seems that when the arrest is broken is also when the eggs start to become susceptible to the movement-induced mortality. Another important implication from this study was that in this experiment with these green sea turtle eggs, hypoxia for three days didn't seem to be detrimental to hatching success, which indicates that using these low oxygen treatments or hypoxic conditions to extend arrest artificially in green sea turtle eggs for transportation um, could be viable and lead to uh, good hatching success rates if these eggs need to be relocated anyway. Now, as I mentioned, we use these perspex chambers and nitrogen cylinders um, to flush the chambers of any oxygen by pumping in nitrogen gas. And eggs are often relocated on the beach short distances. And if it's done within 12 hours after laying, you probably don't need to worry about trying to extend the embryonic arrest. And traditionally, since the sort of the early 80s, whenever sea turtle eggs were relocated for research or conservation purposes, eggs were traditionally chilled after um, a methodology developed by Colin Limpus, another Australian sea turtle biologist. Um, however, chilling the eggs has a lot of complications and sometimes you can easily cool the eggs to, to a temperature that's too low and end up freezing and killing the embryo. Or likewise, the temperature within whatever method you're using to transport them can get too high and it can lead to development continuing and the embryo subsequently dying. So our hypoxia treatment or low oxygen treatment could be useful and more easy than or easier than chilling eggs for transportation. However, as you can see here on this photo on the right, it's quite difficult to get nitrogen cylinders into remote turtle nesting locations, such as here in, in the jungle of Costa Rica. Perspex is also um, quite clunky and expensive for, for field work or for use on a large scale. So I wanted to investigate whether or not there's a, a more simple method for maintaining this embryonic arrest and whether or not it protects the eggs and embryos from movement-induced mortality. So in order to investigate this, I collected a bunch of uh, olive ridley sea turtle eggs on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. 
I placed them into, again, a controlled treatment where oxygen was 21% um, or oxygen availability was 21% and three experimental treatments with low oxygen availability. Our tried and tested Perspex chambers, a new Ziploc bag technique where um, we were still using the nitrogen gas, so we're still dependent upon carting those gas cylinders around. But the Ziploc bag that we used was much cheaper and more readily available than having to rely on these Perspex chambers. And then a third novel technique of using vacuum sealed bags, which remove the requirement of having the nitrogen cylinder. You simply place the eggs into these sort of um, food prep um, vacuum sealed bags here, and you can use a hand pump to exclude any oxygen from around the eggs. And so in this experiment, after eggs were placed into those treatments for three days, we then removed them and incubated them as normal in artificial incubators. And a subset of eggs from each treatment were also rotated 180 degrees. So basically tipped upside down um, to simulate movement and, and potential translocation of these eggs and to assess whether or not these treatments protected from movement induced mortality. And for the results from this study, we found that the vacuum seal bags were equally as effective as the Perspex chambers or the Ziploc bags at maintaining embryonic arrest in olive ridley sea turtles. Our hatching success was relatively comparable across all of our hypoxic treatments, slightly reduced hatching success from our control eggs, which may suggest that three days in hypoxia was, was possibly too long for these olive ridley sea turtles. And importantly, though, we found that amongst our um, eggs that were rotated here, that with this, this figure, you can see again, hatching success on the y-axis and then on the x-axis, different treatments. And I've, I've binned the, the hypoxic treatments. So the perspex chambers, the Ziploc bags and the vacuum seal bags all into one group in the orange and to compare between the control and the lowest new treatments. And in the eggs that were not rotated on the left there, you can see the control had pretty good hatching success of around 70% of the eggs hatching. Whereas the hypoxic treatments were about 40 or 38%. But then when we looked at the eggs that were rotated, none of the control eggs hatched. So this indicates that the movement um, at three days after overposition was fatal to those eggs. However, eggs that had been maintained in low oxygen for that length of time and were then rotated as they were removed from those low oxygen treatments had a comparable hatching success to eggs that weren't rotated. So this suggests that extending arrest protects from movement induced mortality. And we've also experimentally identified that movement induced mortality is, is linked to oxygen exposure. So hypoxia is a, a great new um, or a potential new egg transportation method that we can use to help protect from movement induced mortality. Here in the top right photo, you can see my collaborators, Dr. Nathan Robinson and, and Professor Richard Rayner um, on the, the hood of a car who have got some olive ridley sea turtle eggs in a vacuum seal bag. And it's a really simple method. You don't have to use the nitrogen cylinders or the perspex chambers. And so it's uncomplicated and cheap and should be readily, readily um, utilizable by conservationists working around the world. However, one question that often comes up when we talk about translocating hatchlings or so translocating eggs is what impact it will have on the subsequent hatchlings. So as you may have heard, sea turtles migrate around the ocean, but generally return to the same uh, area that they were, they were born. So there is some concern within the scientific community about what impacts egg translocations may have on this, what's kind of called the imprinting process. So for example, eggs that are moved in that BP oil spill from the Gulf Coast to the Atlantic coast of Florida, um, there, quite, there was quite some concern about what impact that would have 
on the subsequent migration and um, return of those hatchlings as adults? Would they end up on the Atlantic coast laying eggs there or back on the Gulf coast where they were actually laid by their mother? So in order to understand more about the impacts on hatchlings, um, we need to know more about where these hatchlings spend their, these early years of their life. It's very difficult to understand. Sea turtles have a, a cryptic life history phase. So, so a life history phase is very difficult to study. Um, as you can see here, this is a tiny hatchling um, leatherback sea turtle on the coast of Costa Rica. Finding these little turtles in the ocean is um, akin to finding a needle in a haystack. And this for a long time has been termed the lost years of sea turtles' lives. So we knew a lot about nesting females and, and adult turtles and even some older juvenile turtles. But the period between hatching when the turtle enters the water and then they start showing up as these older juveniles in some foraging grounds in the ocean um, has been really poorly understood and termed the lost years by previous sea turtle biologists. And so we need to understand firstly more about where these hatchlings go um, before we can understand what impact any egg translocations may have. In Costa Rica at Macquarie Nature Reserve, we attach some acoustic tracks to track hatchling dispersal from the beach. So this was done um, and funded by Upwell, the conservation NGO that's headquartered in California that I mentioned previously. And basically what we did was attach a little bit of Velcro to the, the shell or the carapace of a, a bunch of leatherback sea turtles that had been in different incubation conditions. And then from this Velcro piece, there was some fishing line attached to a float, attached to another float with an acoustic tag attached to the end. So an acoustic tag emits a sound in the water and enables us to follow the hatchling using a, um, an audio receiver. So if you want to learn more about these tag attachment methods, my colleagues Amy Hoover and George Schillinger and Helen Bailey published this technique in um, the Frontiers in Marine Science Journal. And so here you can see Amy Hoover, um, a photo I took of her while we were tracking these leatherback hatchlings as they dispersed off the coast of, of Costa Rica, this time in the Caribbean um, off Aquarii Nature Reserve. And he, here you can see the tracks of these little leatherback sea turtles. And the map overlay is of Papuaia Nature Reserve. Um, you can see the jungle on the left there and then the Atlantic Ocean or the Caribbean on, on the right. And the tracks have been colored depending upon what oxygen treatment the eggs were incubated under. And importantly, we didn't find um, any major difference in dispersal patterns between eggs that had been incubated in low oxygen, high oxygen even in this case, and, and control. The tracks from this study were, were published in scientific reports uh, as part of Amy Hoover's master's work. And again, this was work funded by Upwell. So there's obviously a limit to how far we can actively track these hatchlings using acoustic tags. Um, Amy and I and, and George Schillinger spent um, a couple of weeks on this, this tiny boat and each turtle we could probably track for at, at maximum about two hours. And then we would, we would collect the turtle at the end of that two hour period, trial period, take the tag, the Velcro off, off the animal, retrieve the acoustic tag and release the turtle. Satellite tags allow us to track turtles for much, much longer, but until recently, Satellite tags have been too large to place on these small lost years sea turtles. So satellite tags, and I'm, I'm borrowing an animation here from my wonderful colleague, Sarah Hirsch, who recently completed her master's at Florida Atlantic University. And satellite telemetry or the satellite tags uh, communicate with a satellite above, so when the turtle rises to the, the surface of the ocean and it's the tag is exposed to the sky. Hopefully the satellite, tag, uh, the satellite tag will be picked up by a satellite. That satellite then relays the message to a receiver 
on, on the surface of the earth. And then that information is sent to researchers um, at institutions, institutions all around the world. And we're able to look at where those turtles have been moving on our computers. So these satellite tags are allowing us to track turtles for much longer than what we could for using these acoustic tags. The first such study of, of tracking sea turtle lost years was conducted by um, Kate Mansfield and, and Dr. Jeanette Wynikin here at Florida Atlantic University. This is the first study to, to work on slowly unraveling the mystery of these sea turtle lost years. So you can see here on the right in the, the photo inset on the figure there, there's a loggerhead sea turtle that had been raised in captivity for um, some period of time here at Florida Atlantic University at the Gumbalimbo Nature Center and had a, a small satellite tag placed onto its shell. And here you can see the tracks from that study um, in these white lines at the top of the figure um, overlaid in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see that some of these sea turtles were um, pretty quickly making it almost all the way to the Azores. And they were mostly following the Gulf Stream, heading north. Uh, and then at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina, they're heading out um, more eastward into the Atlantic Ocean. Some of them petering off, heading uh, down into the, the Sargasso Sea region down here, and others heading further east into the, the Atlantic Ocean. This is really cool, and it's the first such study. And since I've arrived at FAU, um, Professor Wynikin, in collaboration with, with Upwell and, and Low Tech, they've been working with even smaller satellite tags, which has been amazing to be involved with. And here on the left, you can see a leatherback sea turtle um, that's about three months, two to three months of age in that, in that photo with a tiny, tiny satellite tag. This is a prototype tag that's been developed in, in collaboration between Low Tech and Upwell. And on the right, you can see the same tag. That's, this one um, has been placed on a green sea turtle in the Cayman Islands. So with improvements in these tagging technologies, we're able to get more <clears throat> understanding of these cryptic years of sea turtles' life histories. So, so far, as part of this large collaborative project between a bunch of different institutions, um, these little satellite tags have been placed on 42 leatherbacks here in Florida who are then subsequently released into the Gulf Stream, as you can see in this photo on the right with Dr. George Schilling and myself um, and Jim Abernathy. We've also released 12 loggerheads um, recently in the last year with these satellite tags on them from the Azores, which is the island chain on the map that I showed previously in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a Portuguese territory. And these loggerheads are setting new records for us in terms of the most time at sea um, these tags have been emitting for, which has been really exciting. And most recently in January of this year, we, we released 30 green sea turtles from the Cayman Islands with these tags, which you can see on the left in this photo here as well. Now, these tags are prototypes, as I mentioned, and so we are working in this large collaboration to try and understand more about how these tags function and, and really um, learning as we go, which is, which is an awesome um, process to be involved with. And so far, like we've, we've had some really interesting preliminary results. On the left, the figure here um, in the top left you can see is the tracks from our first six turtles that were released in the Azores back in November of last year. And you can see the on the on the far left of the figure where a lot of the tracks are sort of condensed, that's the Azores there. Um, some of the, the turtles, for example, um, 212871 are affectionately named Alan after Alan Bolton, uh, a, a famous sea turtle biologist from, from Florida. That, that turtle has traveled half the distance between the Azores to Portugal, mainland Portugal. And what this figure highlights is that these turtles are really moving through vast expanses of open ocean. Um, they also seem to be um, staying within preferential current regions, so, so eddy currents. 
And they're also, when we look at, at sea surface temperatures, they seem to be preferentially selecting for regions that have, have sea, sea surface temperatures that are conducive for their, their growth and, and maintenance. In the right here in this um, figure, we can see the Cayman Islands in, in the sort of centre to, to top right of the, the map here um, where all the tracks are sort of coming out from. And our green sea turtles in this case, they sort of dispersed in all different directions, which was something that kind of surprised us, to be honest. We were expecting there's a major current system in the Caribbean Sea that, that runs through the gap between Cuba and, and mainland Mexico there. And we we're expecting the majority of these turtles to head up through that current. But as you can see, they sort of fanned out in all different directions across the Caribbean. These tracks, most recently, we've seen this turtle in the south here that's headed all the way down to the Panamanian uh, um, coast near the border with, with Colombia. So it's been really interesting and amazing to be involved in this novel research and, and trying to unravel the mystery of these, these lost years. But importantly, we can use this information, the tracking data from, from these studies, to help better inform distribution models. So this model here you can see has been developed by Tony Candela and, and Dr. Philippe Gaspar from Mercator Ocean International. And this basically shows you a heat map of where to, we can expect turtles will be in, in the Atlantic Ocean at various stages throughout their life history. So in the, in the blue here, we can see, this is if they, if they were born down here on the coast of South America, in the first year, they'll, they'll be traveling up towards the Gulf Stream. And then as they grow older, there's the, their habitat shifts and they move across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, these models are, are models, so they're not reflecting of, um, of real-time data. And when we input our satellite tracking information into these models, we can help continuously improve the models and then it will enable us to better identify regions of the ocean uh, where these turtles uh, are likely ending up. So this is important as we're slowly understanding the, this, this really interesting mystery of where these turtles end up. And it's gonna to lead to an improved understanding of their survival, behavior and distribution during these critical years. It enables us to understand risks to the different populations and assess how the distribution of these different sea turtle populations at different stages of their life overlap with the different threats that sea turtles face at sea. This hopefully will help us to improve their conservation, which is the end goal here for this research. As I mentioned, this, is a, this has been a huge collaborative project working on this Lost Years project. It's funded primarily by Upwell uh, and Dr. George Schillinger, who's the director of, of Upwell, has been working on all of these releases. Mercator Ocean International, um, Dr. Philippe Gaspar and Tony Candela have been doing a lot of the analysis of the tracks and the modeling of ocean current systems, sea surface temperatures, um, and they're a really invaluable, um, a valuable resource for us on this collab collaborative project. We've been working with, with Costa, an NGO um, at the University of the Azores, and Dr. Frederick Vanderpeer in the Azores Island for the loggerhead turtle releases. Uh, with the Cayman Turtle Center in the Cayman Islands with Dr. Walter Muston. And here at FAU, Professor Jeanette Wynikin has been really instrumental in developing the tag attachment techniques um, and the husbandry of, of raising these turtles while we wait to, to release them with these tags, as well as the Assistant Laboratory Coordinator, Emily Turler, who's been working on um, a lot of these releases as well and traveled with me to the Cayman Turtle Center back in January for the Green Turtle release. And obviously low tech, the company that have been developing these prototype tags in collaboration with Upwell um, to really push the, the boundaries of, uh, around um, how small an animal we, we can track in the marine environment. So in summary from all the, the key takeaways I'd, I'd like you to sort of take from my, my talk today um, is obviously that we know that turtles arrest embryonic development in their low oxygen abducts. 
and that the development doesn't recommence until these eggs are placed in the nest after around 12 to 6 hour, uh, 16 hours of, of um, being in the nest. At the, that point, the embryos then become susceptible to movement-induced mortality if the eggs are, sh are shook or, or rotated vigorously. And low oxygen or hypoxic vacuum seal bags are a useful method to artificially extend the pre positional embryonic arrest to help us protect from movement-induced mortality during egg translocations. Now, we, up until very recently, we didn't know much about where hatchling turtles disperse throughout the ocean. And work that's being conducted, um, a lot of it here in Florida and at, at Florida Atlantic University, is, is slowly unraveling these mysteries around the sea turtle lost years. And our latest satellite tracking research is, is sort of helping to fill the gaps and answer a lot of questions that we have around these um, really interesting lost years period of sea turtles' lives. Bringing it back out and zooming back out again to the, the key threats to sea turtles and, and some potential actions that you can think of taking personally yourself. So, of course, fisheries bycatch, we can make sustainable seafood choices or sustainable <clears throat> um, consumption choices individually. For pollution and, and pathogens, we can try to reduce, reuse, recycle, participate in cleanups, transi transition away from using fossil fuels. Obviously with deliberate human harvest, it's easy to, to simply not consume or, or buy turtle products. In addressing coastal development, we can advocate for sustainable and turtle safe development along nesting beaches around the world. And in the case of global warming, it's important that we all make an effort to reduce our, our carbon footprint and vote for the planet. So for my talk today, I'd like to thank a, a bunch of people who I've listed here on the screen, particularly um, Dr. Schillingan, um, Professor Wynikin, Professor Richard Rayner as well. Um, those three people have, have been my direct um, sort of mentors throughout the different positions I've had over the last 10 years. I've learned an invaluable amount from, from each of them. And I'd also like to thank all of the different institutions that have funded my research over the last 10 years and also the facilities that have really helped um, along the way with a lot, of, a lot of this research. So I think I've um, finished with a, enough time for questions here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sean. Very, very interesting. So we already have a number of questions, um, but if you have a question for Dr. Williamson, please uh, click the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen and uh, type your question there. We will go through as many as we can in the rest of the remaining time. Uh, if we should run out of time, we will ask Dr. Williamson to answer the remaining questions uh, offline and then post them, post the answers on our website. So I don't know, Sean, if you can answer the first question we have here. Here. Um, you know, being in a tourist environment here, we do have in, uh, often something where we uh, somebody does a beach restoration, um, which usually involves quite a bit of disturbance with machinery, lights, piping. Um, do you have any knowledge on how that affects the, um, the turtles and what the rules are when and how that can happen, given that there are significant laws that govern, um, you know, especially during, during um, uh, hatching times uh, and, and egg lay seasons, um, you know, what, what laws govern those kind of activities? Yeah, so, um, you know, these, these sort of coastal development activities or coastal restoration activities that are that are occurring in different areas of the world but especially here in florida i think it's pretty evident when you drive along the coast here in florida to see that the development that exists um you know it does have major impacts on sea turtles so the the adults um initially they they may be kind of put off if they come up to nest on the beach and they see that it's um particularly well lit at night or there are you know large pieces of machinery moving up and down the beach um, and it's important to note, though, that the, the regulatory bodies that exist, um, it's, it's 
quite quite strong regulations here in Florida. Um, likewise, where I'm from in Australia, a lot of these projects are undertaken with impact assessments and um, there's an, sort of an attempt to ensure that, that those projects are done um, sort of with a minimal impact as possible. Obviously, the, the, the female turtles that are trying to nest at that location, probably if they do come up and there's major works being conducted on the beach at that time, they're going to move to another section of the beach, either further north or further south, in, in this case, if we're talking about here in Florida. Other areas of the world, it, it's a bit of a problem. There's, there's less, um, it's not so simple. They can't just move to a, a section of the beach further up or, or further down. And in some cases, you know, it could be more detrimental to the population. Um, and then as far as impacts on hatchlings, yeah, definitely like the, those sorts of projects where there are lights on the beach, um, you know, are going to have negative impacts. And there's been, you know, a huge amount of research that's been done on light pollution and impacts on, on hatchling dispersal, hatchling orientation. Um, and a lot of that work has been done here at Florida Atlantic University with, with uh, Jeanette Weineken and, and Professor um, Mike, Michael Salmon as well. Um, so, you know, we understand a lot about that. And with these projects, a lot of those sort of re-nourishment projects that they do here in the Florida coast, um, you know, they can relocate the nests that are laid in that area outside of that zone to make sure that the impact on the subsequent hatchlings is minimised. Um, and then there are other practices as well, like within those zones, making sure that the correct um, wavelengths of, of light are used whilst working on the beach to make sure that they minimise the, the impact on the hatchlings because hatchlings are, are attracted to, to specific wavelengths of, of light. Great, thanks. Um, I'm coming back to some of the methodology that you mentioned earlier, where you compared the different methods of um, packaging, basically the eggs. Um, you mentioned the uh, uh, the hypoxic treatment. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the hypoxic treatment compares to uh, the method of cooling the eggs? Yeah, so um, it's a great question, and it actually makes me think that we need we need to have a more more systematic review done of how these different transportation methods have have impacted hatching success rates in in lots of different research and, and conservation projects around the world um, look the, the the data isn't isn't relatively um, available or you know quickly available and and condensed to make that clear comparison um, but from from anecdotal experience uh, especially for us, um, who are based in Australia, um, you know, a lot of our research universities and, and research endeavours are conducted in the south of Australia or on the eastern coast where we have our major universities and, and research centres. And our sea turtle nesting occurs in the north, in the tropical regions of our country. So historically, turtle, turtle researchers have transported eggs thousands of kilometres from these tropical nesting sites south to the universities to study them. And, you know, it's not often published or, or talked about, but, I mean, in, in my um, collaborations in the past, we, we've, when chilling eggs, we've had it go awry and, and, and boxes get too cold or, or get too warm during transportation. Um, I know of other research groups within Australia who have also experienced this problem. The problem is, though, that data often um, isn't necessarily published. Um, and so, you know, making a direct comparison of how these hypoxic um, low oxygen treatments compare or, or, or how often they lead to, a, to an egg successfully developing or not um, is a little difficult. But in general, if we were to be applying these low oxygen treatments on a, on a broader scale, I would be confident that, you know, within the time period that you need to, to actually complete the transportation, which is probably at most 48 hours, so two days, we've seen gen generally very um, low reductions in hatching success using low oxygen hypoxic transportation in, in those sorts of timeframes. Yeah, sure, when you start pushing it to three days or, or six days or eight days, it's kind of like a dose-dependent effect. The, the longer that you keep them in low oxygen for, the fewer and fewer eggs will actually start developing when you release them into the, the normal level of oxygen. Okay, very interesting. Um, another question here on uh, like operational logistically, uh, what are the pros and cons of relocating X to a designated uh, nursery area of the beach uh, for easy monitoring? Yeah, so this is a practice that is, is um, 
sort of readily conducted all around the world. Uh, it doesn't um, tend to happen too much here here in Florida. Um, but here in Florida, it's generally pretty good at, at being able to leave the, the, the nests in place. You don't have too many issues with poaching of, of sea turtle nests here in Florida, which is great. Hopefully we can keep it that way. Um, but, yeah, in areas where I've worked in Costa Rica, um, the every nest that's laid on the beach is, is um, conservationist attempts to, to relocate that to to a hatchery just because of the, the risk of, of poaching by um, by humans is so so great that if they leave that nest on the beach, then those eggs are going to be taken and sold in, in the wildlife um, trade, either for direct consumption um, or usually for direct consumption of the eggs. So, you know, it depends on the context of where you are in the world um, and, and what, you know, benefit you're, you're doing by moving those eggs to a hat, what's called a hatchery. Um, and what impacts that has on, on those eggs, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of research that's been getting conducted over the last 20 to 30 years about this issue. And like a lot of science, um, you know, one study may uh, publish results that suggest that there are negative impacts of moving eggs to hatcheries. Other studies tend to find that there aren't negative impacts on those eggs. I think on the whole, if people are following, you know, the best practices possible um, in terms of how to move the eggs safely, how to construct the artificial nests in, in the hatchery, how to maintain the, the medium in the hatchery, so the sand, um, so that it's so that it's amenable to embryonic development. Um, if you're following all of the, the best practice steps, then I think that the, the impacts of those hatchery translocation practices can be can be minimized and you know in certain um circumstances and scenarios we we have seen really beneficial impacts on endangered populations of sea turtles for example the campus ridley sea turtle which only uh nests in the gulf of mexico traditionally nested in rancho nuevo in in mexico and the u.s fish and wildlife in collaboration with the Mexican government relocated thousands of eggs from the 70s through until um, the 80s from Rancho Nuevo in, in Mexico to um, Padre Island in, in Texas and incubated those eggs in hatcheries. And now there's a, there is a um, strong nesting population um, in South Padre Island, pa Padre Island in Texas. And so it just goes to show that, you know, these practices can be beneficial for conservation impacts. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Um, you mentioned the, uh, where, how you're tracking the uh, hatchlings as, you know, when you're releasing them and where they're going. And they were kind of distributed almost everywhere. Um, the question here is, has, have there been any studies uh, that compare um, hatchlings coming from a normal uh, hatching location versus those that were dislocated or removed uh, to a hatchery. Um, uh, do you see any difference on where these hatchlings are going? Yeah, it's a good question and, and, and the topic that I'm really, really interested in and, and hopefully into the future we can understand more about it. At the moment, we're just getting to grips with where the normal hatchlings go. So, you know, that's our priority for the moment is trying to understand more about, about where they go normally. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, the um, study that we did off the coast of Bacquare had hatchlings from different incubation treatments. So from low oxygen, normal oxygen, and actually even a high oxygen treatment in this case. And we found no difference in dispersal or swimming behavior or swimming speeds between those, those um, eggs that have been incubated in these different conditions. So... You know, that's, that's a positive first step, but it's a very preliminary study at this stage with a small sample size. So, you know, into the future, I would, I would want to see that um, repeated on a larger scale for sure. Yeah. Um, I know we have a number of more questions and we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to finish us off with one more question and then we're going to ask Dr. Williamson to answer the remaining questions offline and we'll, we'll, we will post the answers on our website. If you look for Division of Research, Florida Atlantic University, uh, research in action, then you, you will find those answers. And just as a reminder, this is our last presentation for the season. We will be back uh, in the fall. So please look out for announcement there. Okay. 
Sitan, you mentioned that um, uh, hypoxia, the arrest uh, occurring with hypoxia, is that effective for all species of turtles or is that um, uh, limited to certain types of species? No, in, in every species of turtle studied to date, um, so this is now most of the, the sea turtles, um, uh, quite a few of the freshwater turtles have been studied and, and low oxygen seems to have the same um, effect on, on all um, turtle embryos. Some turtle, freshwater turtle species, you can actually even put the eggs in water and that will suspend the development, um, particularly a, a species from the north of Australia that the eggs are laid in, in a flooded nest to begin with and the embryos don't break from the arrest and start developing until the, the water table drops and the nest starts to dry out. Um, this is relatively unique to turtles. Um, I looked at whether or not crocodiles do this during my PhD. Um, it's a lot more difficult to work with crocodile eggs because they have a tendency to, to bite back um, if you try and <laughs> steal, their, steal their eggs. Um, but, you know, so not a whole lot of research has been done on early stage development in crocodiles, but it seems that, that crocodiles don't have the same ability to arrest development in low oxygen that, that turtles do, even though the embryos are laid at relatively similar stages of development. Um, we think that chameleons um, use this low oxygen um, hypoxia to arrest development as well. And there are other, you know, there are other animals that use embryonic arrest, um, but they might not necessarily be controlled by oxygen. For example, kangaroos can pause development of, of their young. Um, this is controlled often by, by hormones. Um, so, you know, there's different techniques that different animals have, have evolved um, to adapt to their, their ecological conditions to enable them to, you know, pause and restart development, which is really neat. Great. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much, Sean. Again, uh, the remaining uh, answers to all these uh, great questions that we're still having will be on our website shortly as soon as Dr. Williamson can get to the answer to answering them. Um, thank you again for a very engaging uh, presentation, Sean. Thank you for calling in. Look for uh, announcements for our fall session uh, shortly to come. With that, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, we hope to see you in the fall. Bye.